So, um, show of hands, who in the group has put on an event like this before? Very few, huh? Um, can we thank the iSecure team? The amount of manpower it takes to pull this off is absolutely stunning. Everything from the catering to the venue to the technology, which we're struggling with, all of that <laughs> is an uh, amazing uh, amount of work. So thank you, iSecure. <laughs> If I could just take a moment, and if my college professors could see me now, oh my word, they'd be terrified. <laughs> so, the front of the stage of the college auditorium, oh my word. So, my name is Chip Crane. I am the uh, IBM Security Technical Business Unit Executive for the distribution market for North America. I'll give you a moment to write that down. Don't worry. Um, nobody? Yeah, nobody ever does. You know, it's kind of disheartening, to be honest, but that's okay. I don't expect it to resonate. What I hope does resonate with you is, is I reported to the CISO of a global retailer. Day in and day out, I got to work with him, had a great honor, phenomenal guy. I still get him lunch with him occasionally. He's starting to blow me off a little bit more these days. He's a little closer to retirement, good for him. But um, I would fill in for him while he was over in Europe. And then when he would get bored with Europe, he would send me to Europe, and I would fill in for him over there. So I had the honor, the luxury, if you will, to sit in project meetings for him, committee meetings, board meetings for that matter, and I actually got to sit in the chair. So I'm very familiar with your side of the table, probably more so than the IBM table, and it was a stunning amount of work. And I got to learn the nomenclature, the taxonomy of the CISO role. I got to, to build my own little CISO network um, and really understand deeply what the client needs were. And that was just a, a gift, a, a true gift. So when I came to IBM, I like to believe that somebody said, wow, look at his resume. I wonder who hired him into IBM. He's got almost exclusive CISO you know, uh, networks and, and opportunities. You know what we'll do? We'll use him to talk to CISOs all the time. Or realistically, it probably looked like this. Who in the world hired this guy? You see his resume? Holy cow. He doesn't know anything but to talk to CISOs. What are we going to do with it? I don't know, I guess we'll put it in front of CISO. Either way, however that took place, it's not uncommon for me to talk to five or six or seven CISOs in a week. And frankly, um, I talk to CISOs of all sizes, all the way from where the CISO is to wearing a network engineering hat, a network security hat maybe, all the way up to you know the major banks that you already know and financial lives, right? So I really get an amazing amount of exposure to those CISOs. And frankly, I've been doing this long enough that I, I build a network, a real relationship with those guys. So, in the lark, it all started with the lark. I, a, I wanted to ask the guy the questions. The first time I met with him since he got promoted to CISO, he had come up through the ranks of the security team, and he was now Don the CISO. So, at lunch, I just said, hey, how does it feel to be a CISO? You know, the same way you ask, how does it feel to be a year old on your birthday, I didn't really expect a real response. The guy gave me a phenomenal response. It was very well thought out. I was stunned at what a good response it was. So, the next time I was with the CISO that I knew pretty well, I asked the question. Again, just blown away by the fact that they were giving me thoughtful responses to this question. So, I kind of put it into the normal repertoire. So, I would meet with them and I would ask the question and they would give me their answer. And I'm a self proclaimed geek. So on every plane ride home, I, I write, you know, I take notes to, to what I had done that week or that day or wherever it was. So I started including the answers they gave me, just at the end, just you know, kind of something to do on the plane, I guess, um, and fill those in with my copious notes. And I would go back to them, and I would ask again. So with each kind of, you know, transition of their, their career, I was there to ask that question, right? Now, I don't want to mislead you and make you believe this was some scientifically drawn out thing. This is an extremely informal survey, Chip's just asking, how does it feel to be a CISO? But it became pretty ingrained in our meetings, so much so that at lunch one time, I'm getting ready to head to the airport, and I said, hey, I really appreciate your time. I got to run, I got to catch a flight, it's good to see you. She looks at me and she goes, hey, you didn't ask me how it feels to be a CISO. <laughs> well, how does it feel to be a CISO, right? So I asked her the question, and our relationship was repaired instantly. If that's a lesson for you guys, or do you handle that yourselves? But I took immediate action. That's all I'm saying, all right? Ask the question, fix the problem. So, on yet another plane ride, east to west, west to east, whatever. Somehow or another, I don't have Netflix downloads, right? So I've got nothing else to do on the plane. 
And I decided to, to kind of analyze this data. So I start reading the responses of how does it feel to be a CISO. And I started kind of looking at, at the you know, different people, the different size of organizations, um, you know, the, the different stages of how long they've been in the role. Again, I don't want to imply this was some scientifically based thing. Yeah, this is just Chip's little notes, right? But man, was I blown away. I was absolutely blown away by two things, just, just stunned me. One was, is how similar they all sounded. I mean, it was, it was incredible with, you know, how many times you would hear them describe the exact same problem. Maybe with a few different words, maybe from a different angle, maybe with some different adverbs, pronouns, adjectives, maybe. But, but ultimately, it was, it was the same problem. And then the other was just how much thought they put into this. The CISO role, in my humble opinion now, anyway, is it's, it's a little bit different. It's a very emotional role. It, I mean, your, your life, your career is on the line every day when you're out there. So there's a part of that job that, that isn't like a normal IT job. It's very emotional. So I decided I would, I would net those stories down. Uh, and that comes down to, to, or I should say, net those answers down to two academic stories. And the one is, he had been in the role for uh, just a few, you know, just over 18 months, I believe it was, asking him to fill me a season. He said, Chip, I knew, I knew about the company. I'd come up through the ranks. I, I understood that this was a hard job. I, I knew we had a thousand mile journey. And frankly, I knew I was going to have to walk every foot of that thousand mile journey. I even knew that this was in a desert. So, so it, you know, my best case scenario was hot sand, but I was going to have to deal with cacti, broken glass, rattlesnakes, scorpions. I knew this was going to be hard. Chip, I've got a great team. This team that I've got, I tell them to charge a hill, and we'll go together and charge that hill, and we'll take that hill. We're that good. Okay, so what's the problem? Chip, once we get to the top of the hill, we don't know if we head in the right direction. We're not sure where to go next. Now remember, this is a C-level guy who's, who's wanted this job for many years. He's finally got his seat at the table. He has the respect of the rest of the seats. And he's literally telling me he doesn't know which direction to go. Right? Let that hit you. The second, a lady. Been in the role about five years. <clears throat> very mature at, at her level. Very mature organization. Really high quality. Um, true professional would put them anywhere. Company, you would absolutely know the name of it. Which, by the way, if I slip up and use a name, everything is hypothetical. Everything from this moment on in this conversation is hypothetical, okay? So hypothetically, she tells me, okay, I gotta fix that, sorry. Is that so workable? Okay, good, good, good. So she tells me, oh, you wanna know how it feels a bit so let me tell you how it feels a bit so She said, imagine an NFL state you stand on a 50-yard line. The, the stands are packed with your adversaries. Not just ticket uh, seated, not just seated ticket holders. I'm talking about the stairwells, the causeways, the canteen, the bathrooms. Everything is filled with your adversaries. 100% packed state, right? You have no idea which, which angle they're coming at you from. You, you don't know if they're working together or not, Chip. You don't know what technology they have at their disposal. Frankly, if we're honest, you don't even know when the game starts and when the game ends. You stand on that 50-yard line wearing a blindfold and nothing else. How does she feel? Oh, we forgot to tell you, this is interactive. <laughs> How does she feel? Overwhelmed. What else? Isolated. Exposed. Isolated. Confused. Terrified. Right? She's a C-level, been in the job for a long time, very good at her role. Probably in the top 50 in the country at her role. And she was telling me this is how it feels to be a, a CISO. Pretty powerful stuff. Okay. Jeff, a lot of your anecdotal stories are cute and all, but put some real life in. I'm at my, I'm at my desk. It's a fall Monday morning. I remember it way too well. Uh, my boss, Paul, the CISO, was gone. Uh, probably a year of time, I don't remember that part. Half our CTO, who was homed in our office building, had wandered his way upstairs, probably to talk to Paul at a chit chat. Paul's office is dark, the door is closed, my and Paul's offices uh, are adjacent, so Pat walks into my office. I'll say Pat's a nice guy. Hypothetically, Pat's a nice guy. <laughs> so, 
Pat and I chit chat. We talk a little bit about golf, football, our kids. I kind of remember that part, not a whole lot, but we did. It was just that Monday morning conversation. So Pat's done. Pat is physically walking out of my office. So secretly, I'm kind of going, I've got to get some work done today, Pat. You know what I mean? Uh, and then he stops. And he turns around and goes, Chip, I have a question for you. Well, remember, he's my CTO. He controls most of my budget. So I want to answer Pat's questions. And besides, I like to consider myself a nice guy. I want to answer Pat's questions. So he looks at me and he says, Chip, are we secure? Three words. Three words. Are we secure? Now, I'm an engineer, right, at in, in, in heart. So what am I doing? My head is doing math. I have five data centers in the U.S. I just enabled 5,362 trucks with these new IP satellite devices. I got 250,000 employees in the U.S., right? I'm trying to map my way out of this problem, trying to get them an answer. And of course, what's passive, <coughs> not very attractive in point of face, is I'm trying to do math in my head, right? Chip, let me make it easier for you. Are we going to get hacked today? Thank you, Pat, for making that so much easier, right? <laughs> So, again, I'm trying to do math. Now, by the grace of the good Lord, divine intervention, Pat dissipated out of my goal away and I never answered his question. So, is, is, are those legitimate questions that Pat should ask me? Now, remember, I'm the acting CISO of the day. Major organization with 500,000 employees, right? Uh, we did $52 billion that year in sales. So, we're not talking a small company here, right? It is a legitimate question. Oh, it's interactive. No? Of course. Of course? Anybody else? He's the boss. He's the boss? Does that make everything he says right? Nope. <laughs> Annette, I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried for you. Is it a legitimate question? It is a legitimate yeah. question. He's what he cares about. I sure didn't agree. I'm sorry. I, I'm more on your side. No, it's not a legitimate question. What are you talking about? You're a mature individual. You're a very bright guy. I've been in meetings with you all the time. You're a bright, bright guy. You know I cannot answer that question. I would live. Well, that's your answer. Live. So they tell me I literally cleared three rings of cubes around my office today, day <laughs> venting about this. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Dude, you know technology. You've been in this field for a long time. You know our organization. You know where we grew up. We sold groceries for crying out loud. How can I answer, are we secure? How can I answer, are we going to get hacked today? There's, there's no right answer for that. Pat, that is not a legitimate question. Until, I'm embarrassed to admit how many days, but a few days later, I realized it's not a legitimate question. Because that's what Pat's stakeholders are asking him. And that's what your stakeholders are asking you. It's not about, hey, do we have firewalls in place? Hey, do we have the identity access management tool in place? Hey, are we practicing defense and depth? Hey, are we, are we ISO standards compliant? Are we doing it? That's not their question. What are their stakeholders' questions? Are we secure? And are we going to get hacked today? Now, sometimes they ask it different ways, but that's the truth. That's what they really want to know. It's that simple. Okay, so <clears throat> since we don't have the answer to that question, I thought we would drop some of your logical architecture. Sound fair? We'll just go one by one and we'll just put all the logical architecture you're working on a day on. We have all day, right, Annette? I mean, I'm good. <laughs> we'll work right through lunch. We'll work right through lunch. Thanks, Tom. And, and I'd really like to, to go ahead and put up all the logical architectures for the last couple of years, and maybe even everything you're working on for the next two years. Is that okay? I like it. People are committed. I think we'll get through it. So what is the single asset we have as IT? Information. Data, right? Is that me? Sorry. All right. Data. Now, I'm going to draw data in this beautiful little relational database. Looking at icon, right? We all know that it's a relational database, right? Um, is that what our data is today? No. Do we know where all the data is? No. I asked in a room of about a thousand one time in this presentation, and some poor soul raised his hand. He regretted every minute of that after Because <laughs> you do not know where all your data is. There are just too many thumb drives, there are too many laptops, there are too many cloud storage spaces. You can't know where all your data is because your well meaning associates are going to find a place to put that. 
right? To help them out, right? So they're gonna do that. So what do we do in IT? How do we fix this problem? We pay really smart development teams to go and build an app for us. And then we also pay the data steward to, or the data owner to say this is where the data is and this is the query you need to be able to write to be able to get that data to the app. Agreed? Okay. I'll even stipulate that we, we pay a lot of really good money to some really smart data people to optimize that throughput to make it as quick as possible. Now, where does the app itself sit? Lots of places. I love that. Somebody say cloud. Somebody say cloud. 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 <laughs> what does cloud mean to you? Somebody else's data center, I love it. It's sitting on a server somewhere, in some data center somewhere, right? So that's still not very useful. When does it become useful for us? I'm going to stop giving the answer. It's when we actually get it to the laptop, the phone, the tablet, or whatever, to the end user, where they can actually use it, right? Agree? I'm going to ask the question, um, is, is this the logical architecture of every project you've worked on for the last three years? I, I, would, I would stipulate it's 98% of the, the projects you've worked on in the last few years. And I could argue, I hear people saying no, and I've had this argument and debate. I, I believe if we uncover what you've been working on, you're going to find that this is 98%, right? I think. Pretty close. So I think this is the, the simplistic architecture that Pat's on his head. I think Pat was saying, sure, there are three boxes that you have to cover, my friend. Why in the world can you basically not just put a nice big padlock right on top of that phone? It's three boxes. Go fix that. Right? Is it really that simple? Didn't we just agree though that this was the logical architecture for many of our projects? Yes? But isn't it that simple? No. Why isn't it that simple? Fast, worried about availability. Worried about availability? You would worry about a microphone right now, driving me nuts. <laughs> Sorry. Is that better? Yes. It's more, it's more distributed than that. What do you mean by that? There are there are so many more uh, <coughs> lines that should be going out to the various components that make up each each one of those. The, the network transmissions, the protocols that have to be used, the encryption that's going to be used, all of the different components to get it to that end user. So you said three things that I want to put up here if that's okay. One of them is the infrastructure, the geeky, geeky, gorpy infrastructure that's out there. Network devices, uh, servers, routers, switches, cabling, etc. right? That's out there and it's complicated, right? The other one is the fact that this gets replicated more than once. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. So much so that we've coined this horrible term called shadow IT. This is a personal mission of mine. I'm really, I hate the word shadow IT. It sounds cute and fuzzy, doesn't it? I think it's one of the worst things you've ever had happen. Um, I love to tell the story, so we'll share this story because I'm on stage and nobody's going to pull me off yet. So I'm, uh, I, I was the head of North American Security, reported to CISO. So to get your application and your project, whatever it was, into production, you had to get my signature or Paul's signature to say you had been through security. Well, to help you out, when you kicked off your project, we assigned you a security architecture that marshaled you through that process, right? We did the evaluation, we did all that, we did whatever we needed to do until we had you where you were ready to go to production. I get a request to show up at a production turnover meeting tomorrow, just before lunch, and uh, it's for a project, we'll call it Falcon. And I never heard of Project Falcon before, so I go to my architecture team. And I go, hey, who's this word on Falcon? I haven't seen anything from it. I'm a little disappointed in you guys. I should have been briefed. I need to go read all that tonight and so I can sign off on that tomorrow. They look at me and say, we don't know what you're talking about. Nobody's worked on Project Falcon. Okay, there must be a project management office that shepherds them through this process, so they messed up. It's really not a production turnover. It's probably a kickoff meeting. Can any of you architects go with me? No. We don't have time. We're not busy. Chip, you don't do anything anyway. Why don't you go deal with that, right? So, just being honest, right? So, I go to me. Right before lunch, it's literally on my way out to lunch, so I stop in the conference room. I happen to walk in to that uh, godfather position, you know, right up the conference table, and, and right down the conference table, on the other side where Mr. Pullman's sitting right now, is uh, the VP, 
right? The line of business owner, if you will. Well, on this side of the table, I recognize most of the people. I didn't work on my team or anything, but I, I seem to recognize them, right? Lunchroom, whatever, gym, whatever I know. This side of the table, I've never seen these guys a day in my life, right? So, I walk in and say, hey, just want to make sure, you know, I understand that you guys are ready to kick this project off. I'd like to help you all sign an architect. Uh, go ahead with your kickoff. I don't have one for you today, but we'll get you called out. Don't worry. No, Chip, we're trying to go to production. Um, I, I, don't, I don't understand. None of my architects know anything about it. Yep, that's right. We don't care, pretty much, is what they said. Um, so we need you to sign off. Well, I'm not signing off on this. When do you expect to go to production? Well, Chip Friday. <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't understand. See, there's no way you could go to production Friday because you don't even have access to our mock app. And I watched the head on this side of the table kind of pivotal. I picked up on that, I might add. So then I said, well, after you had the mock data, then you would have to get lab access, which is our pseudo-production redacted data that we put in the lab. You would need that next and two heads start to spin. And then you've got to be kidding me because there's no way you have QA data to be testing this with, much less, Lord forbid, you would need the production data before you go live on Friday, and this whole side of the table is absolutely pivoting like this. They elect. What do we know now? What do we in this room know? No security. Well, okay, we know security. Yes, you guys are geniuses. But <laughs> what I meant was is that what I figured out in that half a second was the fact that they already have all that. So they elected some poor soul who was in charge of their side of the project to stand up. I kid you not. He backed up into the corner of the room like this to tell me they not only had my mock data. They already had our lab data. Now, they didn't have access to the lab. They had borrowed that data at the lab. And they actually had our production data sitting on a web-facing server. They were waiting on my signature to click a button to publish the URL. <laughs> Shadow IT is a problem for me. So it gets replicated, all that, just so I can say it gets replicated over and over and over again. I like to tell stories, bear with me. So, it gets replicated when we don't even know it. What else makes it complicated? Human, or, or, or. Human interaction. So we have to ask ourselves, who has access to this data? And then as soon as you ask who, what do you have to ask? What data do they have? What access do they have, right? Are they getting access to it? Yep, are they getting access to it, right? So, because just because you should have access to the corporate network doesn't mean you should have access to everything. Sure, you're in HR, but why don't you get more that? And you're an RD, why don't you get HR? Right? So we gotta figure out not only the who are allowed in, but the what, right? All right, so I think that's enough of the complications. We could go on for hours, no question about it. So the, the title of this is Think Like a CISO. So let's think like a CISO. Who wants to be a CISO? <laughs> wow, that is telling on our industry. Who wants to be a CISO? No one. Okay. We've been listening to you talk. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm telling you the good side. It's the sad part. Um, you guys love CISO Edge. You, like, you guys love CISO Edge. All right? So, here's how being a CISO works. This is your logical architecture. What do you want to do next? That's what that question means. <laughs> well, I know now. I need requirements. See, I love this face. If you can see the face he's giving me, everybody does, man. It's not just you. Sure. Who here has, has listened to their boss do a job for years? And you know, you knew every question he was about to ask, and you knew what the answer was going to be on the con call. But now today, you're the one that has to ask the questions for some reason. It's way different when you all of a sudden know it, right? It is so easy to be the director of security and look at the CISO and go, what you want to do is, right? Versus when you're actually the CISO. So, you're right, it's hard, it's a challenge. So you want assessments and all that, that's great. But what do you really want to do? What, talk, what's next? I mean, I need requirements. Okay. I need the business requirements. All right, you've got those. Okay. We know what that is. They, they want to be able to have their data available on their endpoints when they want it. Okay. What's the, I mean, I mean, things, I mean confidentiality levels. Okay. The classifications of the data. So what's your job today? Don't tell me. Let me guess. 
Um, you're a true security professional. Yeah. Because you're thinking just like a true security professional. Here's the summary of the entire hour that you have to listen to me talk. Here it is. You're a CISO now. And this is where I have to coach my CISOs with. It's not about how. Not your job. You have smart people to go figure out the how. You, you have vendors, you have solution providers, you have great partners like iSecure, right? You have tremendous people to go figure out the how. You have tons of people doing that today. You need to figure out what needs to be done. And as a CISO, that is such a hard transition to make. Because you, you, you don't care how anymore, you just care about what. And I think the, the what is the requirements, right? Well, the what, I, the, the business requirements are, I had that here, and that is all over the place. We've all said that, it's been replicated. And I need to get the data here to exactly the right person at exactly the right time, and I need to make sure that no one else is allowed to see it. That's the requirements of a CISO. Every CISO on the planet, I might have, right? NSA all the way down to your local bookshop. So, who me help? Can I be your CISO consultant? Sure. Am I hired? Yeah. Okay, you're gonna fire me later. Yeah. I know that. I feel it. I don't need the But I'm gonna go with it. Because I'll take the money today. So if I were your CISO, I would want to pick something out of here to target. Because saying I have to tackle everything, it's untenable. It's not realistic, right? Now I do have to tackle everything, but starting there is, is a tough spot. So so pick something up here you'd like to grow. Data, I love it. I love the data. Idea. It's a great idea. It's a great idea. As your CISO consultant, here's what I would want to do with my data. I would want to say, you know what? I, I just want to create policies as a CISO. I want to say things that say like, okay, you're an HR, you should get HR data. I get it, no problem. That's easy. But you know what? You shouldn't really get my, I mean, we have a work from home policy, right? We have a work from anywhere policy. So we're cool with that. You're gonna need HR data, but you get at the coffee shop, look at my personal information, doesn't really excite me. So I, I as a CISO would wanna say something like, if you're off, not in our office, you can have access to my cube number, you know, my office phone number, my band level, my title, maybe who can report to but why would you need that? <laughs> Sorry, the in the room knows and I'm starting to get great at IBM now that I'm using that lingo. Anyway, I'm sorry. Nobody else knows what that means. Nobody else knows what that means. Salary, grade level, whatever. But, yeah. So, ultimately, you could be looking at things that aren't relevant to, to really who I am, but why would you need to look at my home address from the coffee shop? It makes no sense. Of course, why would you need to look at my salary information? or my emergency contact information. None of that needs to be done in the coffee shop. So I, as a CISO, would like to write a policy, a policy that said you can look at all of the non-essential, non-personal identical oil information, PII, uh, off-site, I'm cool with that, but to look at any of the personal information, PII, I want you to be on-site. So I want to be able to write a policy for that. Sound good? Not for my business, but very sure. Okay, good. So the next thing I'd like to say is, you know what? I really want it so that if you're looking at salary information, not only do you have to be in the office, but it's got to be between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Because I can't imagine a good reason you'd be looking at salary information at 9.30 at night. <coughs> I would want to be able to say things like, you're, you know, you're an R&D, and you normally look at 45 records in a week. But all of a sudden, you just looked at your 50th record, and it's Tuesday. I might want to alert somebody, your manager. I might want to alert somebody to the security guy. When you make it to 50 rack, 55 rappers, now it's 10% above that, right? Sorry. So I, I really want to alert security. I really want to make sure that someone knows. And if you want to get to 60 rappers, that's a 33% increase. I want to shut your access down, right? I want to have policies that are that smart. I want to have policies that can say things like, you logged in with the valid credentials from New York at noon. And now you're providing those same valid credentials from the West Coast at two hours later. Is that plausible? Not really. Anybody have an F-16? Because I'm a pilot. I would love for one of you to have an F-16 I can ride in. Um, no, that's not, that's not very likely. So I want to have a sophisticated system that says, that the policy says that if you can't geographically get there, you don't get access to the data even if you provide credentials. Now, I'm a, I'm a greedy CISO, but that's what I want. That's what I want to be able to do, right? All right, what else? What's next after that? <coughs> Quick question. Yes, sir. Um, isn't this all really 
It's going to be based on uh, risk or threat analysis of the data itself. Look, I only take questions I want to answer. <laughs> it's not really a question I want to answer. No, actually, that's a fantastic question. The net net of this is, right, no matter how much coolness we put up here, you have to come down to business questions. That's what you have to come down to. So you have to analyze what's it worth to the business versus what the vulnerability is to what I call real threat, right? So I equate to this, and I tell CISOs this all the time. Look, if you bought a car for your child that was $2,000, would you go and pay $2,000 to insure said car? No, it doesn't make any sense. You just rebuy the car, right? But at the exact same time, if you bought your wife that $280,000 Porsche, right? Would you, would you only pay $500 or $2,000 to insure it? Probably not, right? It, it just, you, you have to be able to balance this. Stop and think about the fact that you don't pay the minimum insurance on your beautiful new home. That's not how we do it. So you can't go in from a, a, a risk-based model of saying, hey, I'm just going to be compliant, right? It, it doesn't make sense. I really struggle with compliance-based seasons. And I'm working on an evangelist trail and to take care of that because it's it's a huge problem, right? I am compliant, therefore I am secure. No, no, sir, you're not. Ask many, many breach people. You'll figure out they were very compliant, if there is such a very compliant word, but it's a problem. So you're exactly right. You really have to balance all of this with that business. But that's why I want it to be policy-based. Maybe I find out. Maybe I literally have a CEO that says, you know what, we're going to gamble. I love Vegas, Atlantic City. We're going to gamble. You got nothing for what? Well, okay, well, then you're going to set your policies to the minimum, I guess. You know what I mean? But ultimately, you as the CISO, you need to be in control. Fair enough? Awesome. So, what do you want to pick on next? App. Yeah. App. Ah, I love it. Um, app to me is super simple. I want to use a cool security term called harden the app. Apps. Plural. As a CISO, man, I, I want to take whatever apps out there, I want to uh, turn my tool toward it, and I want to start trying what a hacker tries. Inspect every element of the app. Pick it up, turn it over, look around, try what a hacker would try. Right? Now, I don't know if I have the code or not for that, so I don't care. I want the tool smart enough to just be able to look at it, launch it, inspect it itself, and go and start attacking. And if it finds anything, even a little bit of success, I want it to alert security, alert app dev, and let them know exactly what it tried and what worked and what didn't. That's simple. So I have CISOs tell me all the time, Chip, I don't have to worry about that. I've outsourced all my app dev. <laughs> okay, so what you're telling me is you're not even in control of the apps, and you're just going to blindly trust that. You can outsource all the development you want to. Why can you not outsource? Liability. When they let you a fine, they're going to let you a fine on you. Well, oh, that's okay. I've got a contraction bound so that you know I'll pass that on to them. Maybe, but you're going to be the one that pays the fine now, and then your legal team is going to go find out if you get paid for that somewhere else. Right? What's even more important that you can't outsource than the fine? Front page. You cannot do that. You cannot get the media to report on someone other than you. Anybody remember the headline, um, CVS data got breached? Remember that headline? Technically accurate. CVS was never breached. They never penetrated the walls or the systems. They didn't know it's not a threat to CVS. None of that happened. The data had been moved to a third party who was in total control of that data. It was actually a little bit stale data, and that data got breached. But I don't understand. Why didn't the media put that data in? You know, because that, that would look like a really interesting headline. Small firm in Southern California that no one's ever heard of before was recently breached. <laughs> Doesn't really sell clicks, does it? No, of course not. So why are, you know, they don't care about that. They only care to be able to sell their clicks. Let's be honest, that's what the media is there to do. They're a business too. I'm not faulting them for it. I'm just telling you the reality. So if your data gets breached, you're going to be the one on the front page. So you may outsource all you want to. Ultimately, you're the one responsible for it. So, I wanted to make sure that it goes and tries every one of those. And whether I own it or don't own it, whether it's commercially available or not, internally developed, I don't care. I want something looking at it all the time. What's next? Endpoints. Infrastructure next. Okay. I think you got the crowd voting against you, but that's okay. It's okay. 
I love it. I love it. And you're going to set your own direction. That's a great CISO line. I heard all your feedback. Now we're going this way. So, <laughs> yeah. duly noted, duly ignored. So, um, with the infrastructure, I want to order something off the web, or my local vendor, or my local partner, and I want it to show up on the dock. I want to take a box cutter, slice it open, plug it in the wall, plug it in the network. And I want it to start listening to the network. Everything on the network. And I want it to take whatever it sees on the network, and I want it to compare what we call known thread signatures, known thread vectors, and literally match those up. And if it finds anything that it knows, I want it to take some steps. Maybe that's as simple as isolate that particular device. Maybe it's as much as, hey, let's just report to security. Or maybe it's as drastic as, we've actually got a major breach going on. We've got serious malware. We've got ransomware working its way through the network. So I want to start isolating things, maybe sub-segment the network. I want to start shielding me from the problem. That's what I want from an infrastructure tool, right? But what does known threat signature mean? What is known threat vector? That's old information or something that's happened in the past. Somebody has already paid the price. Because it wasn't known at one time or not, right? So we call that zero day. So somebody took a zero day. I don't want any pain as a CISO, right? I know I'm a greedy CISO, but I don't want that pain. So how cool would it be if I could get the tool to, now this wouldn't be right out of the box, granted, but what if the tool could look at my environment and say, hey, this is what goes on every day. And, and this is pretty much what good looks like. And as a CISO, I'd like to be able to turn two dials. One dial says that if that changes by 3.7% or 13%, whatever I say, turn that dial to 3.7%. If it changes more than that, alert me. Let me know. Something's up. It seems a little odd to me. I want the other dial to be able to say if it changes by 4.3% or 14% or 20%, whatever, I always just start acting just like we've been breached because I believe we have. And I want to start isolating environments, I want to let the security, I want to subset, I want to do the same thing it would have done with a known vector. Right? That's what I want as a CISO. That's what I'm expecting out of infrastructure. Questions? Do you want AI front line? Of course I want AI front line. <laughs> what a great idea. Remind me of that. We ought to add that. So, <laughs> what's next after infrastructure? All right, endpoint. This is going to sound very repetitious, but guess what I want? I want policy based on this. I want the reality of I want to be able to set policy on. Do I own it? I own it. I, I hate to admit this. I don't even know what I own and what IBM owns. I think I own my phone. I'm pretty sure I own this iPad. But I'm not really sure. I'm pretty sure IBM owns the Mac that I carry. Honestly, most companies don't really own an IP piece anymore, those, those implements. They're just not there. If that's a policy-based machine, the assumption is that you do own it. It's a managed device. Okay, so let me change it on you. Okay. It's not. BYOD. You don't own it. It's BYOD. Okay. I should still write policy on BYOD. I agree. I want to write policy on that. I want the policy to be as simple as, hey, you must use a password. And it must be this long and this strong. You're going to access my network, my business data? Yeah, that's what you're going to put on there. And you're going to do it with this little agent or whatever it takes, right? But I want to be able to enforce that. And oh, by the way, I know this is a little greedy, but I don't want you to use the same password that you use for Facebook. Because Facebook, oh, I don't know, might be compromised, figuratively, <laughs> weekly. I don't want you to use your LinkedIn password. I don't want you to use any password you use outside my environment, inside my environment. I want a policy that says that and holds that to it. That's what I want. I'm agreeing to see, so I get it, but that's what I want. I wanted to be able to say things like, you must run this OS level, this patch level. You must run all of these pieces of software that I require. Whatever that is, as a CISO, I want to dictate that. Honestly, I also want to say, you, thou shalt not run these pieces of software. Don't raise your hands, but anybody have Snapchat on their phone? Okay. If you don't, please don't. <laughs> but if you do, make sure you have the latest and greatest update. Right? Because if not, there's huge vulnerability in some of those. Uh, it's already publicly known now, and when I was giving this like a month ago, everybody said, oh my gosh. So, but, so I want to be able to say, thou shalt not run Snapchat or whatever I said. That's what I want out of those pieces, right? So, um, you can pick anything else you want. You can't read what we'll say, but anything. The, the, the who and the what? <laughs> who and the what? Who and the what? Uh, are you challenging my penmanship? <laughs> 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 
I once was told you write in tongues. <laughs> you know what that means. So this is the who and the what. This is all about the identity access piece. Again, I'm a CISO. To me, this should be simple. Plug in the HR system. When you're hired, you get access. If you're not hired, you don't get access. Right? Now, I'll take it a big step level, but sorry. A step lower, another level. I don't really want to say that. And I'll say things like, look, you accept the job, but you're not really coming here for two weeks, right? So I want the tool to be smart enough to say, hey, you're a new employee, and you're going to start on 731. Okay? Well, I don't want the tool to wake up right away and do anything, because I don't want that ID laying out there. But five minutes before you walk in the door, why can't the tool wake up and say, hey, it's 731, you're going to be here at 8, 755, I'll go out and create an ID for that, and I'll provision you exactly what you need for your job role that HR has. And I'm going to give you a password that's very patternistic, very algorithmic. It's going to be your, you know, your last name and your birthday with your zip code on. Something like this. Because as soon as you walk in, the guard's going to walk with you. It's a lot of Appreciate you coming in today. You're going to love the job. Please sit down right over there. It's going to ask you for username and password. Combine your name, whatever else I said in the code, all those things. And boom, it's going to force them to change their password right away. So my exposure with that account was like, what, seven minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, right? That's what I want out of the tool. In a little way, I want the tool that as soon as you graduate from this job to the next job, I want it to take all the access from the old job and the new job and stack them together, right? You guys are passing the test. I saw what you said in there. It'd be amazing how many times I like, yes, no. No, what I really want, you collapse all the old and you create the new to be precisely what you need. And we continue to do that. And we never, ever, ever stay, right? That's what I want the tool to do. You give me that face, why? Are you in reality? <laughs> See, I'm on the stage. This isn't reality at all. Right? <laughs> I think if I was saying things like, oh yeah, that would never happen. How much did you save a lot of money? Pay a lot? Well, hold on, we'll come back to that. Hold that question, sincere. What was that? How about terminations? How about terminations? The moment you're no longer in the HR, you're out of the system. That system. Now, I'm, not, I'm just going to revoke your rights. I need to keep your ID, right? But let me go back to when you change. So I really want the system to be smart enough to say, um, yeah, it doesn't really work in reality like that. I can't cut your access off today just because you got a new job. So I may as a CISO, as a gracious, merciful, nice guy, not like my CISO at all. Um, I may say, here's two weeks. You got a two-week transition, or 30 days, or three months, whatever I decide. The CISO, I can give them that transition phase, right? So that you do keep both access for a little while while you're doing both jobs. But what happens when separation of duties problems come in? I want the tool smart enough to know that. I want the tool smart enough to say, oh, let me give you a transition period. Oh, wait, no. Not going to happen. Can't have that. And I want a nice little note that goes to the manager going, sorry, I appreciate the transition idea. Not going to happen. Right? That's what I want from the tool. Now, once I have this in place, right? Is that okay? Sure. More questions? What about, what about um, you know, financial people? Don't we need to recertify them every 90 days, 180 days? Okay, so what if our, what if our tool actually said to them uh, to recertify however many days you decide as a CISO? So we're just gonna send a note to the data owner, maybe the VP, maybe the data steward, whoever they decide, that says, do you still need them to have financial access? I want the tool smart enough to do that. I want the tool smart enough to say, hey, as a contractor, he's supposed to be out of here in 90 days, we're at 85 days, send a note to the manager saying, hey, is he really gonna be here for five more days, or? Do I let it go earlier? Do I keep him on? What do you want me to do? That's what I want the tool to do. So now, if I had this with Pat, and Pat walks in my office, how do you feel as a CISO? Yes, sir. How do you I, I, you know, this is my question. This is how you start the whole thing. I need money. <coughs> okay. If you make this happen, I just need money. Yes. All right, so, so as a consultant, let me help you. All right? So first of all, I'm going to tell you that, hey, we've got all the bases covered. So Pat, buddy friend Pat, I've got all the bases covered to your CTO, right? <coughs> and I've got a person watching this, and a person, and a person, and a person, and a person, and they're watching that village, not taking their eyes off glass, right? And I sure hope they're talking, because I'm only a little worried about it coordinating with Pat. <coughs> not good enough? I agree. So how cool would it be if we had a security, incident, and event management system? And how cool would it be if we could take events straight into that SIM system? And I want it to be smart enough to be able to look across all of those events, consolidate, correlate those, right? 
And I believe that that's going to generate, I don't know, 50 to 100 records a day, maybe. Really small company. How many records? Sure. 100 million. Okay. All right. All right. So apparently, I need the sound to be really scaled. Really scaled. On average, if you're a particular company that I won't name out loud, <clears throat> throw in, but I might average 2 billion events in a day. They come into that system. I need a system so scalable, it can handle billions of events, <clears throat> correlate, consolidate those down, right? Because now, if I had that, Pat walks into my office, Pat, love your friend Pal, I got all your bases covered. And oh, by the way, if something bad happens in our environment, I'm gonna know about it. If something bad happens in our environment. How do you feel about that statement? You don't like it? Why not? I need, I need to know what something bad is. Okay. All right. So, so if we had, if we had all these billions of events coming in, and we're consolidating all the way down to say on average twenty-five, what are we doing with the other one point nine? Blah blah blah. I can't do the math now. Billions of events. What if? What if? You're a genius. What if we analyze those the same way we do business data? What if we literally ran reports on it, and we got so good at forecasting? That it would be if something bad happens in our environment, it's if something happens in our environment, right? Because sometimes it is legit login credentials that come at us, but it's still not right. Sometimes it's a legit ping that isn't really legit, right? So if something happens in our environment, we're gonna know about it. Pat, buddy, friend, pal, if something happens in our environment, we're gonna know about it. How do you feel about that? How do all the other companies that are in Breaksville? How do they feel about if? It's when. It's when. When something happens in our environment. So you know what I want as a CISO? I want a cyber emergency response team or tool that the SIM that takes in all that information, consolidates it all down to, to actual offenses. When it's a true offense, I want to just go ahead and alert the cyber emergency response team. And I want that smart enough to pick it up and say, this is what we need to do next. And by the way, I want it so smart that it actually is able to give you commands, that you run forensic commands, and then when that comes back with the result, it tells you what to do next. And it just walks you through the process. Good idea, bad idea? Like it? Awesome. Right, awesome. All right, I like it. All right, so you want to see something go, I've got a wrong book, Chip, don't need it. You can get how hard my job is sometimes, right? So then I tell them, okay, show it to me. And I go, okay, it's on Danny's desk. Who's Danny? So we go and see Danny. Danny pulls it out. It has to kind of do this to get the book open, right? Okay, when was it open? A long time ago. Um, so you get the drill, right? I want something that's up and current, right? I did have a funny story. I've got extra time, right? Yeah, you told me I got hours. Okay, good to go. I'm going to run all over it. Um, I had them flash the 10 minutes at me one time. I'm like, don't worry, I got way more than 10 minutes. You're okay. <laughs> so, see, um, anyway, the guy, I, I'm telling this guy the story, right? He's our worker for a long time. He's a guy. He said, we just finished our run book. It's solid, rock solid. I said, cool, awesome, that's fantastic. Um, tell me about it. You know, is it really that great? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, because I know what you're about to ask me. And we had the same contractors that serve the DOD help us with this run book. Chip, it's solid. I said, fantastic. Let me see. He brings me the paper book. I'm like, you can't it. So I just simply asked one question. I got thrown out, but I asked one question. I said, well, you know, at what threshold does it tell you that you need to notify the rest of the organization that you've been breached? He literally threw it on the floor and escorted me out of, the, out of that room. He didn't really throw me out. But, but at what level do you notify the rest of the organization you've been breached? Where, where does the tool tell you that? Where's the book telling you that? When do you need to notify your board of directors you've been breached? When do you need to call the local authorities? When do you need to call the FBI and tell them this is going on now? I want a tool that's gonna help me with that, right? I want a tool that's smart enough to figure that out and tell me what to do. And frankly, I want it to provide a phone number and an agent name. That's what I want out of the tool, right? Okay, all right. Pat, buddy, friend, pal, when something, anything happens in our environment, we're gonna know about it, we're gonna know what to do about it. How cool would it be I can see him shaking his head no, he's still uncomfortable. How cool would it be if I knew what my neighbor to the left and my neighbor to the right was doing? 
Because I don't want to see my environment. That is a true problem with most customers. We only get to see our one environment, right? I really love to know what else is going on. So what if, what if, what if we had a worldwide research company? And that worldwide research company's job was to literally look at hundreds of environments like mine. And, and they did the exact same analysis that I do online. And then they surf the dark web and they look for other possible problems. And, and they put together a report. And they print that report out every day. And they put it in the front seat of a car, put it in a brown envelope, mail it to me, and I read it the next day. So you're conflicted. Because you're like, I really want the information, but I've never heard of snail mail for any of it. <laughs> no, you know what I want is a CISO, and it's greedy. How cool would it be if it would automatically feed my SIM every day? How cool would it be that as soon as they knew about a new null, a new null threat signature, they would literally update my SIM? It's pretty cool. Not there right now. Huh? Is there a lot of people that are not there right now? Uh, are you there right now? <laughs> not, before, not to put you on the spot, but you asked me. Assume, assume yeah. that you pipe intelligence feeds, multiple intelligence feeds. Okay, multiple there, intelligence feeds. I love, I love. Is there so, an enterprise that literally does not have that right now? Oh yes, you know there, there are plenty of enterprises that are not are not at a usable level across the enterprise. Okay. Right. So, so let me finish it up. I mean, unless you want to come on. Okay. Oh, I, I, I believe you do better too. But so we get this feed on a nightly basis, right? And now my guys can go out and change configurations on all the other tools, right? But, but what if I was trusting in a good way and I actually just let them update those because again, a new configuration, a bad firmware or whatever, they can get that update. Now I'm a CISO, I'm not gonna let them have to learn across the network willy-nilly. But there's no reason I could get automatic feeds into the configuration files of these tools the way it should be. I think so. Pat, buddy, friend, pal, I've covered all your bases. We're collecting all that in one spot. When something happens in our environment, we're going to know what to do with it, right? And oh, by the way, we're getting better every single day because we're changing that configuration on our own and becoming more predictive. But even better, we're actually taking all of this information from a worldwide research company and feeding that in and actually changing our configuration on our database. So our security posture gets a little bit better every single day. I'm sorry, the graph should go this way. <laughs> That's what I want. Now, you're very CEO-ish. I love the white hat. I want to be that when I grow up one day. <laughs> Here, all that. You're the CEO. You've done a marvelous job. You've created this new app. You took your app dev team, brought them in, they came in under budget and under time frame, and they created an app. What's even better than the app is the fact that the app is actually generating money. $2 million a month net new revenue for you. Not bad, not bad at all. What's even better than even the $2 million is that social media is a buzz. Your customers love it. Love this new app. I love this company. I wish they sold groceries so that I could buy my groceries from this company. This company gets me. Press has picked up on it and got an interview in two days, right? CNN, Fox, whatever event you're at. We're in New York, so who knows? So, <clears throat> You're going to be on that interview. Today, you just got an email. And the email says that the art app hardening tool has just told you that you have a vulnerability in that app and that your customer data could be exposed. You do not have a breach. We are not leaking data. Nothing has been exfiltrated. But you do have a vulnerability. What do you want to do? Ready? Go. Patch it. OK? It's an internally developed app. Tell me how that works. He's in charge of that. Yeah, go. Does it work? Run, run, to, run the code to mass flight. Okay. Figure out the code going to this line. Oh, we already got that. The tool told you exactly what it was. Told you the line. Exactly. Change the code. Change the code. All right. So you're gonna you're gonna check it out of the of the and coding system, right? Our version control. You're gonna have them go and work on it today. And then what are you gonna do? I'm gonna test it. And okay. Test it. How long does it take to test it? And the point is. You test it fast, you want me to test it and test it now. So <clears throat> I, I, I describe that as this, and this is how I normally get this. Is we're going to take our best developers, shove them in a room closet, put some red hole on this side, some pizza on this side, right? right? And we're going to tell them, you don't walk out of this room until it's ready. And then what do we do with the code when they hand it to us? We magically put it into production, right? 
Well, I mean, we can test it, but if, let's be honest. If you're going to test it for an hour, that's pretty much so just accepting what they did and put it in production, right? Pretty much, yeah. I agree. You know what the one line of code is. I'll tell you the story, because I love to tell stories. So, <clears throat> hypothetically, um, this has happened. Uh, they found the vulnerability. The CISO very much so cares. He's very threat aware, threat based. So he wants to fix it. He cares about his clients. So he has told the app dev team, go get it all of you right now. Go pull it down, fix this, and know what it is. Go. We're going to test it with everybody. Because the first thing we're going to do is you're going to go ahead and put it into production because I don't want the vulnerability there anymore. So he did. He had the dev team go in and fix the code, promote it to production, and then he took a whole week, literally a week, I'm sorry, hypothetically, a week of his organization to test it. He and I stand in the middle of the room, cross armed like this, and we're, nothing is happening that you can hear but mouse clicks and keyboard clicks. That's it. About three rows behind us, we hear, huh. <laughs> We both peel off different ways. We go back and we, I believe the guy's name is Eric. I can't remember. I'm sorry, Eric, wherever you are. Um, but but the, the CISO is very upset. He's oh my gosh, this is still broken. He goes, no, 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 Eric, just calm down, calm down. I'm not saying it's broken. Where, what in the world is, you know, why are you calling us here, right? With your hum. He says, because you see this section that covered here? Yeah, this doesn't exist in production. This is the next rep. Meaning that, what did the developers do? They did what they always do. They pulled down the code. Oh, wait. They pulled down the future wrap of code. Right? That's what they've done. They pulled that down. They had fixed the code. They pushed it back to production. And guess what? They had debug statements. They had never been sandbox tested, QA tested, any of that. And that's sitting in production serving their customers at the whole time. It's very, very tough to do any form of crash coding, I call it. Statistically, you're going to score problems to the one you're trying to fix. So, What's the other one? What's the other option? Crash code is not a bad option. That's an option. I mean, you know, it's not a good option. But... I mean, if it was me in that scenario, obviously, we're not seeing a web tier here. Yep. It's exposed in this scenario. It's a web-facing application. Yep. Whatever your loft is, because I'm a good CISO, I have a loft in place. What? I've got a layer of protection there that I could possibly remediate code vulnerabilities with the loft. There's a stop gap until I have time to fully test and duck the code. And that's what your security guys are going to work on today, right? This morning? Reconfiguring the WAF to stop this problem? For one app? Sure. Yeah, okay. I love it. The man of service. So has anybody else thought of another solution? What disclosure? Disclosure. You want to disclose to your to the press that you've got a problem? Well, one of my, part of my reputation is that I'm responsive and proactive, and I may want to put out bulletin. Okay. It was good knowing you as a CISO. <laughs> <laughs> I would not recommend that, my humble opinion. No offense, but I often get, well, shut it down. Okay, well, I quit. I quit. I quit as your consultant while you're going to talk to the CEO. Because the CEO is going to tell you what? No. Fix it. That's what the CEO is going to say. It really is. He's going to tell you to fix it. How cool would it be if your WAF idea, I love it, that's exactly the right answer, but instead of being able to put the team on it, how cool would it be if the hardening tool? Could literally say, hey, look, I'm vulnerable. Well, that's, that's, that's what I was kind of going with because we got an automation scenario here. And my particular instance of Metasploit running on Rapid 7 that I bought through iSecure. Awesome. Um, iSecure comes to the rescue. I can, I can kick off the code remediation activity, but I can also generate a ticket that kicks off a lock activity. It's a manual service. Nobody from my team has to touch it. The engineers are not I just have to adjust my. Well, the engineers at F5 have to, okay, so what I'm going to get to is, again, you think like an engineer. I understand that. I get it. I do too. Think like a CISO. I don't care about any of that. I just want that app hardening tool to sure. say I'm vulnerable to something that looks like SQL injection. <coughs> SQL injection looks kind of like this. This app is at this range of IPs. How about you not let anything that looks like this go to this range of IPs? How about if instead of having to call a single human, how cool would it be if that tool could then actually report back to the to the uh, infrastructure tool and actually close that down right there. It would be a virtual patch that would happen in seconds. By the time anyone got the email that this was going on, the problem would actually be remediated, at least temporarily. Right? That's what I want as a greedy, greedy CISO. All right? Now, I have to go because she's going to pull me any second. So, but I don't want to leave you alone. I, I want to give you a consultant that's better than I am. So what I'd really like to do is, is I'd like to give you a consultant that's really smart. I want this consultant to be able to read five security articles a day, right? And I want this, this consultant to be able to have purview and insight in your entire environment. 
And I want them to be really smart, so I want them to read 15 to 20 articles a day. And I want them to know about SANS, and I want them smart, so I want them to read 50 to 100 articles a day. And I want them to know about NIST and the dark web, and I want them to read a million articles a day. That's what I want to. Watson, what a great name. We should have named it Watson. <laughs> we, didn't, we named it Q Radar Advisor, the same way if you allowed IBM to name sushi, we call it cold dead fish. <laughs> So what I tell you is, is that, yes, that would be Watson. Watson is great. So that comes back to the AI, right? Um, I want AI to be looking over all of us. I want AI to be catching things we as humans just don't have time for. Now, you asked an interesting point about money, budget, right? So I typically get a CSO with Jim yeah, sure, I'd love to have all that. All that automation, that's cool. Um, that's fantasy. I can't, I can't do it. Sure you can. You absolutely can. Would you like to see a demo? I secure can demo everything I set up here today. I mean, I would give them 24 hours to set that up, but, but they can demo 100%, right? We can do that. That exists today. This isn't fantasy one. It's real. Now, the question back is, is how can I afford it? Well, uh, if you don't have budget, then nice meeting. I appreciate that. Uh, no, if you don't have budget, what I tell them all the time is, is yeah, you know, I've seen two successful runs of this. One is, is to say, hey, our current tools are a guy. And we really want to get this piece in place. And we're going to go and attack this one section of our environment. But we're going, to, we're going to drive really, really deep, and we're going to make sure we've got all the right policies in place. And we make sure that we secure all of that, if you will. Now, I'm not naive. I still wouldn't answer it all. But we're going to go and focus solely on this. And that's OK. That's an acceptable piece. And then they'll work their way through the rest of the argument, right? However, what I think I've seen more successful is, is I say, what's the, pro what's the current project we're working on today? Give me your ROI for that. Okay, you're going to make ten million off that. How about you take a hundred, you know, hundred thousand dollars and let's invest in a small subsection of this, or five hundred thousand, or whatever's commensurate to whatever their ROI is, right? I mean, I've had them tell me as low as the ROI on this project is going to be a couple hundred thousand dollars. First of all, why are you doing that? But that's okay. So if you're going to go after that couple hundred thousand dollars. All right, well then let's put twenty five grand or something. I, I don't know. We just got to figure out what that balance is. It comes back to the insurance question, right? <laughs> but ultimately, we could secure all of this for at least that one project. There's no reason not to do that, and that's where I see them being more successful. Any other questions? I have teenagers. I'm not afraid of awkward silence. <laughs> you have comments. Yes, ma'am. What about the end user? What about the end user? Tell me more. You can have all the pen, it's beautiful and it works great, but one fish attack and it's susceptible. Well, um, that's exactly right to some degree. However, as a CISO, part of this infrastructure tool would be to watch random things like why is a Word document trying to communicate to Russia or China? Why don't we always pick on Russia and China? You know, that's not fair. But uh, why is it trying to communicate outside the organization? So I want it to do a better job of making sure that happens. I also really want to, to couple this, because to your real point is, is that we have to educate our users. We're never going to be able to stop them from handing out the passwords. Anybody ever seen the, uh, is it Jimmy Kimmel that does this skit about, you know, tell me your password, and they do? You know, what, how do you, what, what's the algorithm you use for your password? Well, I normally use my birthday and my, my dog's name. Great, 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 great. So how old's your mother, right? And oh, oh, what's your birthday again? And what's your pet's name? And they've said they told them they've passed it right there on the live TV. It's pretty shameful. So, yes, you're right. We still have the problem with being users. I'm not going to tell you this is going to solve 100% of your problems. And if Pat were to walk in my office and I had all of this deployed across 100% of the organization, honestly, I still wouldn't answer his question yes, we're secure, and no, we're not going to get hacked today. But I sure would have a statistical anomaly if it ever happened, right? Questions, comments, and I'm already over, sorry. I have one more comment. Sure. What about our vendors? What about our vendors? What about our vendors? We should have an application that actually can evaluate it, right? Absolutely. So are you talking about really, uh, going out and doing a risk analysis on your vendors themselves? Right. Yeah, I agree with that, totally. And, and no way does this replace all your humans. No, this is what gives you a fighting chance so that now your security administrators can become security architects or whatever you want to call them. Whatever we can do to raise them up a level so that they're helping us defend ourselves, not managing IDs, not looking at log files, right? Not going and investigating some anomaly that some user says they have, right? Yeah. 
right? Not being called and asked about some phishing email that may or may not be phishing. Guess what? It's phishing. Right? If you think it's phishing, it's phishing. No doubt in my mind. Right, so I'm not saying that we get rid of all our individuals. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we elevate them so that they can be working on much more strategic things. Great comments, thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you very much. You guys have a great time.